Good afternoon. Thank you, all of you who are watching this via AABA's remote portal and for the work that's gone into making a remote option available for these meetings. This talk wouldn't be possible without my fantastic co-author, Robin Nelson of Arizona State University. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm recording this talk in Natick, Massachusetts, which is unceded and ancestral land to the Massachusetts and Nipmuc peoples. Our talk today focuses in large part on the often implicit ways through which we understand the biological and historical world around us. And as such, we are aided by being mindful of our own position in these contexts. If you're like me, you've probably found yourself saying something along the lines of, evolution is heritable change in a population over time in a classroom, perhaps many times a semester in fact. A common textbook definition of evolution, this statement is something we often simply take for granted. From a pedagogical perspective, population is either openly unused or inferred in our most basic definitions of evolution. While recent years have seen considerable scholarship on the heritability part of this statement and the role of non-genetic mechanisms of inheritance, the term population has not had the same level of scrutiny. As Torres and Colon point out in their recent book on genetic ancestry, however, defining a population is not a simple task, despite its centrality to the theoretical foundation of our discipline. As they state, defining a population is not as easy as opening up an anthropology textbook. We often attribute the population focus in evolutionary theory to the modern synthesis of evolutionary biology, including figures like Theodosius Dobzhansky in his foundational book, Genetics and the Origin of Species, first published in 1937. Within biological anthropology, we regularly cite Sherry Washburn for helping to connect a new physical anthropology with the modern synthesis complete with a comparative framework and a theoretical approach driven by population genetics. In his discipline shifting piece, The New Physical Anthropology, Washburn argues that if a new physical anthropology is to differ effectively from the old, it must be more than the adoption of a little genetic terminology. It must change its ways of doing things to conform with the implications of modern evolutionary theory. For example, races must be based on the study of populations. In fact, he only references populations as a way to refute the concepts of races as breeding populations. In 1950, Dobzhansky and Washburn co-organized the Cold Spring Harbor Symposia on Quantitative Biology. The event brought together many of the principal actors of the modern synthesis with key figures in physical anthropology at the time, including Harvard anthropologist Ernest Houghton and many of his students. As this quote from Houghton makes clear though, populations as a unit of evolutionary analysis were not universally admired or accepted. Vasiliki Smokovitis quotes Mayer as saying, Houghton fought a losing battle. By 1950, population thinking had established a well-entrenched beachhead in anthropological thought, end quote. Admittedly, it isn't hard to be somewhat sympathetic to Houghton's complaint, particularly given that Dobzhansky himself, even if we just look at the original 1937 edition of Genetics and the Origin of Species, is not consistent in his invocation of population. Going through the book, there are at least three primary ways in which populations are discussed. One is as a geographically defined unit of study. A population, in other words, is a group of organisms that occupy similar geographic space and environment. He also talks about what I'd call a phenotypic population, or groups of organisms that from the perspective of systematics are readily distinguishable and identifiable. Finally, he talks about breeding populations, or what he later comes to refer to as Mendelian populations. These are units associated specifically with a pattern of transmission of heritable elements from one generation to the next. We'll come back to these categories later. I'd like to highlight Lisa Gannett's work here in particular, who has a number of wonderful articles specifically looking at Dobzhansky and the ways in which his discussion of human biological variation and the categories of evolutionary variation changed throughout his career. Additionally, several years ago, my co-author was writing this piece for Nature and the editors expressed discomfort with her use of the term races. Instead, they suggested she use the term population. In our conversations at the time, it became clear that the term population is used as a catch-all, a substitute for various groupings of individuals. We pondered what to make of this slippage from more technical uses of this term. The term itself is deeply entrenched in biological anthropology research, and the uses seem to be completely inconsistent, or at least without any clear parameter demarcation. Today, our goal is to explore how the category population gets invoked in contemporary work in biological anthropology. Populations are nominally at the heart of the contemporary evolutionary approaches to understanding patterns of human biological variation that we undertake, but what does this look like across the range of subfields in our discipline? In order to address this question, we conducted a bibliometric review of the American Journal of Physical Anthropology from 2018 to 2020. 
pulling every article that includes a reference to the term population within its abstract. In total, this resulted in a sample of 207 articles from that time period, or approximately one third of the total AJPA publications during this sample. From this sample, we coded the data by subfield, sample size associated with populations, how populations were defined, what were the goals of the paper in regard to the populations referenced, and what simply was the range of populations that were being called into existence by this work. We compared our analysis of the larger pool with that of a smaller subsample to check for inter-observer reliability in the emerging themes in our thematic analysis. We broke our data set into subfields that included osteology, bioarchaeology, human biology, genetics, paleoanthropology, and primatology. These categories weren't meant to be mutually ex exclusive, so some articles were labeled with two or even in a few cases, three subfield designations. Overall, population was invoked regularly across all of the subfields, but appeared in the journal most commonly in studies of skeletal samples in the context of osteological and or bioarchaeological research. One of the simplest attributes we can associate with the use of population is the sample size within, of any given population. Across our entire data set, that range extends from a single individual appearing in multiple publications to 1.28 billion people in a paper that uses a registry of surnames in the Chinese population. Leaving aside this outlier, it's possible to look at the typical ranges across the subfields. First off, the largest fraction of the sample and about 40% each consist of samples of fewer than 20 individuals as a population stand-in or samples of 20 to 100 individuals. About 10% of articles include samples of 100 to 500 individuals as population representatives, and just a fraction of papers include larger samples. In general, the largest sample sizes are associated with research that connects with large collaborative data sets. These kinds of uses are most commonly seen in genetics, with sample sizes numbering in the thousands, but also occasionally in human biology work. Genetic papers exhibit the greatest range of sample sizes, with at the large end those papers that use those large collaborative data sets. Um, smaller sizes when introducing, no, quote, novel population variation, and very small in the context of ancient DNA studies. Genetic data derived from archaeological settings tend to get smaller the further back in the past they go, but also the closer to the equator. And in fossil contexts, papers that introduce new ancient DNA have some of the absolute smallest sample sizes. Papers involving living populations tend to have higher sample sizes than those working with skeletal material. Across skeletal-based studies, pure osteological papers tend to have larger sample sizes than bioarchaeological studies, though often this is the result of large museum-based comparative samples that have varied and or uncertain proveniences. Paleoanthropological studies, not surprisingly, tend to have the smallest samples. Within primate papers, sample size is typically presented as a descriptive variable associated with the study group in question, and thus varies by taxon. In terms of how populations get used, in other words, what it represents biologically or not biologically, a few general observations can serve to frame the discussion. First, papers pretty regularly move between population, group, and sample interchangeably. Second, many papers use population within the same paper to reference multiple levels of biological organization. For example, individuals associated with a particular locality may be referenced as a population, while that group is simultaneously referenced as part of a larger language family population, which is part itself of an even larger national or regional geographic population. The modifiers used to specify any given population are also tremendously variable. Some of the broad categories used to specify populations include time in a generic sense, for example, contemporary versus ancient, and time in a specific archaeological or historical sense, such as the Middle Horizon or Medieval. Geographic location is the single most commonly used class of modifier, though the specificity of that geographic invocation ranges from continental scale classifiers, for example, Asian or African, to specific primate research or fossil localities. Many papers use temporal and spatial classifiers simultaneously, with multiple populations referenced from within the same time period and across time periods from a given location, for example, medieval and contemporary England. Aspects of phenotype are also commonly used as modifier terms in, to specify a population. This is particularly true in human biology studies, where categories like childbearing, nulliparous, high fertility, long-lived, or high caloric intake are examples of kinds of populations. 
Looking through these data, it's clear that more than 70 years forward in time from the new physical anthropology, we have not, as a discipline, developed any clear contours to how we define or use the term population. This is perhaps not surprising, as Kaspari pointed out 20 years ago, that while a discipline has moved past the language of typology, it has not abandoned the practice of essentializing biological variation. In the remainder of our time, we would like to consider the consequences of this reality. Specifically, we argue that this inconsistency of usage is a problem both for the application of core theoretical concepts within the discipline, and perhaps even more consequentially, for broader understandings of how human biological variation is understood. It is revealing, I think, to return to the categories of population referenced by Dabzhansky. We argue that in many ways, our current usage of population continues to echo many of the inconsistencies and patterns present in Dabzhansky as well as a few unique ripples to the kinds of question and data that biological anthropologists consider in the 21st century. From a theoretical perspective within the discipline, we would argue that there is reason to view Dobzhansky's Mendelian population as the categorization that makes the most theoretical sense as a unit that describes the differential pattern of transmission of heritable information from one generation to the next. This is, we think, most often what evolutionary populations are meant to represent. However, the subfield differs substantially on the degree to which we might imagine theoretically gaining access to such data. Geneticists have direct access to data on genetic inheritance. Primatologists and possibly human biologists can examine these phenomena directly on at least small scales of several generations. Skeletal-based studies can only do so indirectly, and often the further back in the past we go, larger and larger gaps emerge between the known population parameters. For paleoanthropologists like myself, such aspirations are almost entirely absent. From a professional standpoint, this highlights one of the problems with our current population problem. If we truly envision ourselves as the holistic comparative and evolutionary discipline that Washburn laid out 70 years ago, translating the knowledge from one study to the next across subfields poses a sizable problem. It's a problem of scale, time and space, but also one of purpose. Are we really asking questions of within and among population variation in living populations, one of the most commonly invoked purposes for defining populations in a study, in a way that has any meaning for the more ancient past? Are our characterizations of higher level biological variation in ancient samples at all comparable to present circumstances? Beyond our own disciplinary practices, we suggest this is also a broader problem. Our many and varied renderings of populations lend themselves to both a typological mindset for viewing variation, but also grant our populations a credibility of naturalness. In other words, the populations we discuss are the natural products of evolution given the definition of evolution we promulgate in our research and teaching. Evolution is a population. How are we to intervene in the public's understanding or misunderstanding of this when we ourselves don't specify the mechanisms through which we are constructing the category of population? This is even more problematic when we invoke phenotypic or geographic classifiers that are commonly associated with perceived racial classification systems, such as skin color or continental group modifiers. The conflation of geographic and temporal modifiers on populations also poses problems for how we understand the fixedness of these associations. 23andMe's identification of me as 100% European does not entitle me to any special relationship or legitimacy to that continent. Nor, as our colleague Crystal Sosi points out in this tweet, and as Tall Bear has argued for more than a decade, does a genetic ancestral designation of Native American by a third party vendor confer any special claim to indigeneity? Our invocation of public confusion might seem excessive, but the reality is that public understanding of human biological variation and the evolutionary processes associated with those patterns remain woefully lacking. Simultaneously, the urgency and importance of these issues remain more relevant than ever, as renderings of the naturalness of populations, race, and biological variation have become key points of contention in issues around access to reproductive health or indigenous sovereignty. I wish we had a final slide in this talk in which we could say, this is the solution, but the reality is more complex than that and doesn't support a simple answer. The evolution of our species is complex, multi-layered, and uneven. Patterned biological differences are a reality of our evolutionary past, but this variation is not uniformly distributed across population groupings, nor are our understandings of that history or their consequences uniform. We hope these data will serve as a starting point both for renewed theoretical engagement with the concept of populations as an evolutionally meaningful demarcation and for our understanding of the semantic importance of the specificity in language we use with each other and with the broader public. Thank you for your time and we welcome future engagement on these issues.